And also thank you to the Sussex Right to Life area and friends for inviting me here tonight. I am very honored to be your guest speaker. As Peter said, I uh, had a hand in founding uh, the University of New Brunswick Students for Life. Uh, I am the outgoing vice president right now. We elected a new executive a couple weeks ago. Uh, I just, I'll be graduating in a couple weeks, so I will not be at UMB next year, but uh, I, I hopefully left it in capable hands. Uh, I know I have left it in capable hands, and they're still recruiting several other members. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about uh, what UMBSL does. Uh, it is a student group dedicated to the protection of life from conception to natural death. Um, specifically, our role on campus is to educate students and faculty about life issues such as abortion and euthanasia, and direct women to crisis pregnancy uh, resources and help they need in order for them to make uh, the life-saving choice not to abort. Um, Providing this pro-life voice on campus is important, especially considering the statistics. Uh, one quarter of abortions in Canada are performed on university-aged women. That's 20 to 24. Now, UND SL is not alone in its work. It is aided by the National Campus Life Network, uh, which is a national organization dedicated to, well, helping pro-life groups on campus like ours. Uh, NCLN offers support by giving uh, pro-life pamphlets, brochures, uh, guides and tips to starting a club, and most importantly, they have many advisors uh, on their staff, all of whom have been previously involved in uh, pro-life campuses of their own. Usually they're part of the executive or have founded and then moved on to work full-time for NCLN. Uh, Sarah Hall is the head of the Maritime Office, who works out of St. John. She's been working closely with us since we uh, began last September. And uh, there's also a Western Office in Vancouver, and then the Executive Director, uh, Rebecca Richmond, works out of Toronto. Uh, the task of NCLN and UNBSL and other campus pro-life groups is not easy. Uh, as the pro-life voice on many Canadian universities um, is being actively suppressed by the supposed representatives of students, the student union councils. Um, now, as you are aware, I'm sure most of you are aware, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees everyone's freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. And then provincial human rights legislation also enshrines this value. And but long before the Charter and provincial human rights legislation, uh, freedom of expression has long been a Canadian value. Freedom of expression, of course, is especially important on university campuses. As Rebecca Richmond recently wrote, she's the, as I mentioned, the executive director of NCLN, uh, the university in particular, by virtue of its educational purpose, ought to be a place where free speech is in particular respected and where debate and dialogue on controversial issues such as abortion can take place. Unfortunately, the student unions don't agree, and on many university campuses, they've come up with their own definition of freedom of, ex of expression. Uh, basically, the freedom to express their view and to suppress all other views. Um, they've been basically the filter for uh, which opinions are going to be expressed and which aren't on several university campuses across Canada. We at UNS, UNBSL, that's our group at UNB, <laughs> encountered this kind of discrimination when we were starting our group this past September. Um, we put our constitution together, followed all the rules, um, elected our executive, and put in our application in mid-October. And it was supposed to go, normally these kind of things pass automatically in student unions. The debates over whether or not to approve a club usually last about 10 seconds before they're unanimously approved without a second thought. 
However, when it went to before the student union for the first time in November, instead of voting on whether or not to approve our club, the student union instead decided to put off the vote and ask us a few questions, which they don't usually ask of, of any groups. Um, these questions were uh, whether we would do any demonstrations and whether we were simply an educational group or were going to provide resources uh, to women and others who wanted to know things about abortion uh, and other issues. Um, even though these types of questions normally aren't asked and we felt really they were kind of irrelevant for whether or not our group was to be approved, we thoroughly answered the questions before the next meeting and gave them a written, written response to each one. However, when the vote came up again for the second time in mid-November, the council did the same thing. They read out our answers, um, and then instead of voting on it, they again asked more questions and delayed the vote till the next council meeting. Now those questions this time, again, more irrelevant questions, include, included where we were uh, going to refer women to for counseling, where we got our resources, and they also seemed incredibly concerned about the word defend. Uh, as it was written in our constitution uh, that we were going to defend life. They thought it had uh, some, some indication of some kind of violence. Obviously, they watch a little bit too much TV as we're playing right into the media stereotype of pro-lifers. By this time, it was pretty clear to us that the council was simply delaying the vote in the hopes that we would just go away. There were council members who did not want to pass the group and were very vocal, and some others who just didn't want to offend those council members by voting for us. But at the same time, the union couldn't figure out how to deny us status with a legitimate excuse, so they just kept delaying it. Again, we responded to these questions for the second time. At this time, we added a little bit of uh, strongly worded language saying we were a little bit fed up with the questions and get on with it and approve us because we had activities we wanted to do on campus. And especially since no other group had ever been treated like this before. Uh, at the December meeting, the approval of our club was once again on the agenda. And ironically, after all the back and forth between us and the council, answering all of their questions, they denied our status using the excuse that they lacked information. Adding to that irony of that excuse was the way we found out that we were denied status. Though we attempted several times, we knew, that we knew the vote was going before council that day. And despite the several emails asking which way the vote went, we got no response from council members. I found out through my wife, who found out through Peter, who in turn found out from an American Students for Life group who did a random internet search and came up with a article that was published in the Brunswickin, the UNB uh, student newspaper, that stated that our council had been denied, our, our group had been denied approval. And so the, the United States uh, Students for Life group was looking to offer their support and that's how we ended up finding out that we were denied. So the real lack of information was the information from the council to us and not the other way around. Uh, needless to say, this, this lack of information excuse was simply a poor attempt to cover up the real reason why we were denied status, which was the bias of several very vocal council members. The council's true reasons were revealed in their minutes. Apparently they forgot that those minutes were recorded and posted online two weeks afterwards. And so what we found out from the minutes were that the executive, most of the executive of the student council simply just wanted to pass it and get it over with. But there were a few very vocal uh, members of the council who um, were delaying things and making sure uh, and were, be, were responsible for it being denied in December. Um, even the president of the union, uh, Jordan Thompson, pointed out that it was not the role of the union to bring their own opinions and biases 
when deciding to approve a club. Uh, but because it's a majority vote to approve a club, uh, his his opinion didn't win the day, unfortunately. Um, one such counselor, one counselor in particular, who unfortunately was the law representative, he's a first year law student, so I can't give him, you know, <laughs> I can't blame him too much. <laughs> Uh, spoke a number of times stating his opinion why we should be denied. It ranged from uh, saying that clubs such as ours of political will or intention or single issue clubs shouldn't be approved or on another occasion oh, that we were just a redundant club because the Women's Center uh, offered uh, alternatives to abortion which we know are, is not the case because we asked them. Uh, he even went so far to say that he didn't think that it was the place of a university, that a university was not the right place to have two sides of an issue represented. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a law student, so. <laughs> that might be against my professional code. I'm not allowed to degrade the profession, but like I said, he was just a first year law student. So you are in good hands. Now, um, it was his suggestion that he it was revealed in the minutes that uh, uh, of putting up this this false, vague reason of lack of information for denying us, and uh, he hoped, and it stayed right in the minutes, that we would just go away. That was the, that was the best case scenario: was us just going away and not reapplying again in January. Uh, now, other council members. Revealed similar vices. He wasn't the only the only one on council. Uh, several uh, prejudged that all the resources that we were supplying were full of misinformation, and they thought it was the student union's responsibility to safeguard the student body from what they deemed to be this mis misinformation. Uh, yet, at that point, they had not seen a single one of our pamphlets nor gave specific examples of what information, misinformation they were talking about. It is unfortunate that our experience at UMB is not the only one in Canada. There have been several instances of student unions um, shutting down pro-life clubs, denying them status, um, and other similar things. Uh, Carleton Pro-Life Club, for example, when it applied to use the quad to display uh, the GAP posters, I don't know if any of you are aware of the Genocide Awareness Project, but it displays graphic images of aborted fetuses. Now, this this group was led by a very uh, stalwart young woman, um, Ruth Lobo, who came and talked in Fredericton a couple weeks ago, and so she she didn't she refused to be bullied by the student union and went to the quad anyway, where a number of them were arrested. Uh, following that, the student union um, decided to put it to a vote and declared the student union as a whole pro-choice and banned pro-life clubs from the school forever. Now, student, uh, student union at York University also, same way, declared itself pro-choice. This was after it shut down a scheduled debate that the York Pro Life Club was going to put on. So, instead of allowing the debate, allowing two sides of the issue to come forth, they rather shut down the debate and decide, declare the winner of the pro-choice side. The University of Victoria, again, I know I'm just getting depressing here, but the Uni University of Victoria, again, pro-life club lost its status after the union deemed their posters offensive. The union took it upon themselves that extra role of deeming the posters offensive and full of misinformation. Now, it's not all sad news. There is a happier ending to the University of Victoria um, situation. Uh, after the club there engaged in a legal battle, they were able to win, win back their status and funding. Our own club situation has also gotten better. We did not simply go away, but reapplied in January. And this time, our president, Amanda McGee, and accompanied by several of our members, including myself, 
made an in-person presentation to the council. So we went to the council meeting to make sure that we were heard. Unsurprisingly, many of the previously vocal pro-choice council members, including my friend there, Oliver, were very quiet during this meeting. Um, our, clue, our club was approved pretty easily after little discussion and uh, only a few dissenters. I don't believe that we should have been put through this ordeal. Um, students do not need counsel to protect them from pro-lifers. By censoring pro-life groups, students are able to think for themselves and engage in the abortion debate on their own. Now one thing is clear, although the students may need help debating these, these issues, and that's what we're here for, uh, the student council definitely is no more intelligent than the average student. Council members are in certainly no better position to deem what information is accurate or what is offensive or whether those designations really have any importance at all. And yet they continue to censor pro-life clubs, taking it upon themselves to take up the role of filtering what information students will hear and what information they won't. Now, as a student, I'm angry that they would even decide to take this role on regardless of the issue. It's kind of demeaning to the rest of the student body, and it cannot be allowed to continue. Student union councils across Canada need to be put back in their place. Groups like UNBSL, with the help of NCLN, are looking to do just that, to clear the path for a stronger pro-life voice on campuses, which is so important and needed. So now here comes the fun part, what can you do? Well, you can support the pro-life club at your local university, if you live near a university. We need prayers and encouragement. Uh, pro-life work in general is not easy. Pro-life work when you're at a university is, in my opinion, even harder. As you see the people that you're fighting against day in and day out, it's your classmates and the people grading your papers. So we could use your, fi your, your prayers and encouragement, but also your financial support to put on events to get the message out uh, to more university students. The UNB group and the executive that we've elected for next year are planning to hold a debate, um, but that requires um, getting a professional debater, which fortunately we have a few good pro-life debaters to choose from in Canada, but it does require us uh, paying speaker's fees and hotel stays, food and flights at a minimum. So. If you want to support us, uh, get out your pens. I'm going to give you an email address. Or you can just talk to me afterwards, either one. <laughs> but the email address is unbstudentsforlife at gmail.com. Or if you're more technologically advanced, you can look us up on Facebook. We have a page. And guess what the page name is? It's UNB Students for Life. So either way, you can get into contact with us and uh, if, even if you just want to follow what we're doing next year, see what our plans are. Uh, we're going to, going to be doing more than a debate, but uh, um, I'll still be helping out from Halifax. But it should be an exciting year next year, and uh, your support is needed and appreciated. Thank you.